Welcome everyone. Good evening-ish. There's a difference between being spiritual and uh, enlightenment. <coughs> being spiritual, which is what most people want, which is being a person that's really at ease, being a person that experiences a lot of relief, a lot of expansion, a lot of freedom. Less so, it seems, do people desire actual enlightenment, which is relief from being a person. It is the ease and the peace and the freedom from being a person. So just consider that difference. It's one thing to wake up to something beautiful and real. But ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing in life, especially the things that are of a spiritual or meditative nature. Are you doing these to satisfy, please, ease, and relief the person? Or are you doing these things to actually realize that you're not the person? Find freedom from the person. Ultimately, that's the only state or space or realization in which your peace and your happiness can remain unaffected, can be true, can be solid, if you will. So to not investigate who it is that is this person that is seeking enlightenment or relief or expansion or knowledge, to forget to investigate who is doing the seeking is to sustain this illusion of the spiritual heroin junkie that just goes to get its fix and then the person or the body feels better for a little while. But it doesn't last, does it? The person is made of dis-ease because it's built on a fundamental flawed delusion that you are located somewhere, that you are the body, that you are separate from all that is. That sense of separation is created by nothing but a series of thoughts, a sequence of assumptions. When we investigate the person who's doing the seeking, the spiritual heroin junkie, when we investigate the root of the mind, the core of the me, we can actually transcend it, relieve its of its duties. It's one thing to have a nine to five job for 50 years and get these little breaks in between, but it's way better to retire to not have a job to return to. Correct? So this alone is true peace. It's lasting peace. To not have a person to return to. Now, does it mean you lose your phone number and people, your friends are unable to reach you? Although, from your point of view, actually, it is that way. They're not reaching you. You know, when they say, it was good to see you, I can't help but have the thought come up, well, you didn't actually see me. But, it, yeah, understand the sentiment. It was good to see you, too. Because I'm not the body. You, you have never seen me. You don't know what I look like. You have no idea. You get that? Same for you. I don't know what you look like. I don't even think you know what you look like. Who are you? What are you like? What is the you that is there when you're sleeping? When you're dead? When the body stops functioning? When you're in a coma? 
Who are you then? What do you look like? Do you know yourself? See, enlightenment is not any particular state of consciousness, though it includes all states of consciousness. And it can be fun to journey, it can be fun to explore, and there's higher levels of consciousness that include and transcend and master the lower realms of consciousness. And you can explore all that if you desire. But enlightenment is to be aware of the one who is seeing. You could say that's awakening. And then enlightenment is to maintain that until it becomes more and more natural and it becomes harder and harder to go back into the assumption that you're a person. It's an automatic veil that comes over your consciousness. Usually upon waking up after a really long eight hour, nine hour sleep, 10 hour, 11 hours, some people, <laughs> you have to start all over again. Or so it seems. You have to get that enlightenment engine going again, that self-aware engine going again. You wake up and automatically, there you are, a person waking up. And as the day goes by and you practice and you have little moments, short moments of awareness of awareness, it starts to build a gradual undercurrent. And usually by the end of the day, people are clearer. They are lighter in their consciousness. There's less of an automatic assumption of who they are and more of an actual clarity and a sense of freedom. Now, if you extend this all the way into the night, if you're not too tired, or if you took, if you took a little nap, short nap, so that you don't forget who you are, then you can really amp this up. Or just by deliberate practice in the morning, you can get the engines going quicker and or by polyphasic sleeping, you can maintain that engine more consistently with less big of a gap, less big of a sleepiness, a drowsiness, forgetfulness. Polyphasic sleep means simply sleeping more than once a day, but in shorter chunks, more frequently, but less overall. Improves the quality of sleep and ultimately improves the quality of your waking life too. I mean, it's ultimately personal choice, but... The most important thing is, who is the seeker? And why is he here, or she here, or it here? Again, enlightenment is not a state of consciousness. It is the ideally constant remembrance of who is looking, of what is seeing. It's the awareness of yourself. Not yourself as the body, but yourself as that which knows, as that which sees, as that which is. I'll repeat a drawing that I did during the LA event. And most of you weren't there, so. Earth. It's a little it's a question. 
the continents have shifted a little bit. <laughs> but that's all right. Can you all read this? No? Okay. Awareness or self or God, mind or person, and the world as you know it, the world of the objective world, the world that you think exists out there. So, most of spirituality happens here. It's just another object within the realm of the world. So, let's just do infinity sign. Representing spirituality. So, being spiritual means that you replace the trees with a bonsai tree, and you replace <laughs> your clothing with sarongs or whatever it is and you replace the world with whatever your view of the world is you replace your thinking with perhaps positive thinking or spiritual thinking or higher dimensional thinking and your activities change so you're becoming a spiritual entity a spiritual identity which is all fine and well up to a certain point now what this does not provide though is the consistent experience of freedom or true peace or true True freedom, true knowledge. What this doesn't provide either is knowing who you are. Like there's nothing in here that could ever provide you with an awareness, a direct, immediate, true awareness of what you are. Ever. It's just different shades. It's just like swapping sunglasses. So true spirituality, or rather awakening or enlightenment, has to include the person who believes it's seeing this. So if I'm focused on a world, if I'm talking to you and I really believe you're separate from me and I'm in my automatic mode when I wake up in the morning and you give me a call and I'm grumpy and I'm annoyed by you, <laughs> in that moment, but of course I pretend I'm not because I'm a spiritual person, so I won't let you know. <laughs> so we don't investigate, we don't investigate who is this, who is this? Who do I assume I am upon waking up that is interacting with this whole thing that we call the world, within which we project spirituality as an aspect of that? True? When you think of spirituality, you think of, oh, well, there's the world, and there's Trump, and then there's spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> so every time you have that external focus, you're automatically positioning your sense of self in the mind, in the person, which is an assumption. So now what you create is this, this sense. So when I ask you from that state, who is seeing it? This is the most diluted state you can say. So I could ask you from that state, well, who is having this phone call with me? Who is it that is grumpy? Who is it that is seeing this experience? Who is it that's aware of its feelings? Ultimately, that is awareness. But it's passing through this filter of location the sense of location, the sense of being a person. 
And if this goes uninvestigated, all you know is the world of, of projected form, really thought. This is all thought, believe it or not. The world, as you think of it, is not real. It doesn't exist. It is all in your mind. It's all in your brain. It's a holographic projection of your brain or mind. So, let's say that I'm this little person inside of your view, and we're having a little phone conversation, and I'm asking you, well, who is on the phone right now? on your end, who is on the phone. Now what happens is that this awareness, which is outward focused generally into the sense perceptions, which are also generated by mind, ultimately, it starts turning around because I'm asking you, who are you? So you start considering, if you do it right, you start considering who you are. Who is it that's ha on the phone? Who is it that's grumpy? Who is it that's aware of these feelings that are coming up? Then you get to the root of mind if you have a little bit of an attention span. Now this in, its, in and of itself needs some training. Um, so you become aware of the root of mind, which, it, which arises usually as the sense of I am over here, as this person having a phone call. It's a sense of location, it's a sense of being the body, perhaps even a sense of location inside of the body, which you could consider your sense of the core of who you are as an entity, as a separate individual. And so now, you're starting to become aware of the very root of the mind, rather than its projections. So, you could also say this is the subject, and this is the object. So there's a subject-object duality reality that's generated, which is completely and utterly not true. Doesn't make it not fun, necessarily, although for most people it is not so much fun. But it just makes it untrue, and we're discovering what is the truth, right? Who are you? So, the subject and the object are both dynamic expressions, energetic expressions, of the only isness in creation, which is God, self, awareness, Satchitananda. And so, both the subject and the object are actually appearances. Now, if you're looking at the objects, you will fail to notice that the very person who's seeing the object, the very subject that believes it's perceiving the objects, you fail to notice that that in it of itself is an appearance. You believe this is real, that this is solid, that this is changeless, that this is always here, that this is who you are. But when you start to look directly at the mind itself, the one who conjures up all these thoughts and forms and projections and references, now this inwardness of focus, this self-inquiry, will get you to an awareness, to a state where you can actually perceive that the mind itself comes and goes. That the person itself is nothing but a flimsy construct of assumption. When you have that awareness, this starts to crumble, starts to be perforated. These tiny little black holes start to form. And this starts to disintegrate over time with practice. And depending on the depth and the single-mindedness of your inquiry. If it's very distracted and you're just doing this to be a good boy or girl, or for whatever else, whatever other reason you might have to make this investigation so that you can be better in the world, you know, so that the person talking on the phone line can get a sincere feeling that you're actually doing the inquiry, then you're still doing it for this world. You're not actually interested in self-discovery. 